What's up, guys? Today we're going to be going over aggregate demand. So uh, unit three uh, for macroeconomics. It's going to be national income and price determination. Uh, kind of some key topics that we're going to be talking about are going to be aggregate demand. We're going to be talking about um, what is the uh, aggregate, the aggregate demand curve is uh, downward sloping. Uh, we're going to talk about the shifters for aggregate demand, and then we are going to hopefully move into some money multiplier stuff. So uh, see what uh, what we can do today. Um, just a little bit for those of you guys that uh, that are on or not from uh, El Paso. My name is uh, Mike Jager. I'm a um, economics teacher, AP economics teacher. I've been teaching for about 10 years now, AP uh, econ. I also teach dual credit econ. I have a master's in science in uh, economics from UTEP. And, um, you know, just real passionate about teaching economics and, and love this stuff. So um, we're going to get started here in a bit. If anybody wants to ask any questions, uh, just as we're going through, um, go ahead and just leave a comment. Um, and then I'll kind of get to you guys as, as the comments are going. Um, but I know a lot of us are kind of in the same boat teachers and students as well, just with uh, the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 uh, stuff going on. So, um, you know, if you got a friend or you got someone that wants to, that's taking the AP test, you know, uh, let them know that, uh, that I'm doing these videos. I'll be doing them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, same time, two o'clock mountain standard time. Um, so hopefully we can get a lot more people, uh, make these a lot more fun, uh, try to collaborate with, uh, with other, with other students and other teachers from uh, from around the United States and around the globe. Um, I know the people from, uh, I think it was Turkey, uh, they had a little bit of trouble with the volume, but uh, hopefully they get that resolved uh, on their end. I think it was maybe an internet thing, but uh, any questions so far? We'll get started here, uh, get started here in a second, so. Also, if you're watching this video and you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, if you guys could do me a huge favor and uh, and subscribe, that'd be great. Uh, hit that like button on this video too. That'd really help me out. Um, trying to get some more subscribers, some more views, and just help out uh, help out as many people as we can. Uh, try to get some uh, passing scores. So, <laughs> what's up, Econ Gang? <laughs> uh, as far as EPISD is concerned, I don't know if we're going back uh, the 6th of April. They said just that they were closing indefinitely. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know, Jonah. All right, get started here. Uh, so um, just to start off, so what we're going to be covering is uh, national income and price determination. Um, so first thing that we want to look at, those of you guys that are in my class, if you guys want to go ahead and open up that PowerPoint, um, we're looking at 3.1. 3.1. So what is aggregate demand? So aggregate, just the, the word aggregate, um, those of you guys that are soccer fans, you guys know that aggregate just means adding everything up all together. Um, so when you are playing another team and they aggregate the scores, right, they add the scores for both teams, right? So uh, if Real Madrid is playing Barcelona and it's an aggregate, right, then they add up both scores and determine the winner based off of whoever scored the most goals between the two games. And that's the same thing that we're looking at here is, as for aggregate demand is we add up all the things uh, together, right? And so we use aggregates to combine all prices and quantities. And so aggregate demand is all the good services or essentially the real GDP that buyers are willing and able to purchase at different price levels. Um, the demand for everything by everyone in the United States, there is an inverse relationship with price and real GDP. So what is what is an inverse relationship? Again, reverse relationship means that if price levels go up, right, then uh, GDP will go down, right? So if we see inflation or 
price level is increasing, then GDP will decrease. If uh, GDP is increasing or we see price levels going down, then GDP will go up. And that makes perfect sense, right? Because if people are buying, if prices are less, people are going to be buying more things, right? So um, we'll see uh, that inverse relationship. So um, again, an increase or uh, inflation is gonna cause uh, real GDP uh, demanded to fall and a decrease or deflation, uh, the real GDP demanded increases, okay? All right, so the uh, aggregate demand curve is, uh, is uh, the demand by consumers, businesses, the governments, and foreign uh, countries. So what definitely doesn't shift the demand curve, that's gonna be changes in price levels, be, uh, or changes in price levels is gonna be movement along the curve. Just like, uh, just like the demand curve, right? If we change price levels, the price levels are already set in our demand schedule, so uh, that would be a slide, not a shift. So only thing that's gonna shift the demand curve, or, um, or I'm sorry, what makes up the demand curve, again, is demand by consumers, businesses, the government, and foreign, uh, foreign countries. So that should sound pretty familiar to us. So aggregate demand essentially is GDP, right? The equation for GDP, which is C plus I plus G plus uh, XN, right? Now, um, you'll notice that aggregate demand, let me draw it out here real quick. Price level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, <laughs> um, no, I'm okay. <laughs> All right, so here's our. Uh, let's see if you guys. That's my daughter telling me to keep it down so that we can, she can nap. All right, so here we go on the um, vertical axis. You'll notice that I've labeled it PL, and the reason why it's PL is because that's price levels. Uh, make sure, especially since we're going to just be doing the um, just be doing FRQs, that uh, you label it PL, indicating that that's price level, right? Um, here, if uh, is real GDP, so um, again on the horizontal axis, you want to label that real GDP, not just GDP, uh, because there's a difference between nominal and real GDP, right? And then you notice that this is gonna be a downward sloping curve, right? Just like down to the dirt, demand down to the dirt, very similar, but this is gonna be aggregate demand. Now, uh, let's see. Why is the curve downward sloping? So the, the curve is downward sloping for three reasons. It's the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the foreign, uh, foreign rate effect. So we're gonna kind of go through all of those real quick. So. Um, the wealth effect is higher price levels reduce the purchasing power of money, right? That means that when you increase or you see inflation, your money is now not as valuable, essentially. You cannot buy as much. You have less power in the, uh, in the market, right? Uh, this decreases the quantity of expenditures. So this decreases spending, essentially, because you're or purchasing things, right? Um, now, lower price levels increases purchasing powers, and this increases expenditure. So, um, you know, at lower price levels, right, we are up here on the on the curve. At higher price levels, we are, you know, um, no, I said that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, at higher price levels, right, we're going to see less quantity, right? So we are less real GDP right here at a high price level, at a low price level, right? we would see, so quantity one, quantity two, we would see here, you have a smaller real GDP at higher price levels. Here you have a uh, lower um, lower GDP, real GDP at lower price levels, right? Okay, and so um, this essentially is what is referred to as the real balance effect. Um, so uh, just to give you guys some examples, if price levels double, people are going to buy less stuff, right? Because they have less purchasing power, right? Um, right now, uh, if you guys have been out to gas stations, um, you're able to leave your house, right? Uh, you'll notice that gas prices are way down. So a lot of people are buying more gas, right? Or buying gasoline from convenience stores. Um, and so 
uh, price levels, um, as price levels go up, then GDP demanded goes up, right? All right. Now, moving on to the interest rate effect. When uh, price levels increase, right, lenders need to charge highest interest rates to get real returns on their loans. So, um, um, uh, Alexis, I'll, I'll get to that question here in a second, all right? Um, all right. Um, so, back to the real interest rate effect. So if price levels increases increase, that means that we are at the this point, right, of our um, ADAS model or AD model right now. Um, banks have to charge higher interest loans. So if they're char char charging higher interest rates, then um, people are not going to be taking out loans, right, or businesses are not going to be taking out loans, or they're not going to be taking out as much loans. So because of that. Um, that lowers the GDP, right? Now, uh, higher interest rates also discourage consumer spending and business investment. So you see big, uh, big hits in both of those components of our aggregate demand uh, curve. Now, um, let's see, moving on to foreign trade effect. So when U.S. price uh, levels raise, foreign buyers uh, purchase fewer U.S. goods and Americans uh, buy uh, more foreign goods. Now, just from that, we know from the uh, from our GDP equation, right, x minus n, that um, that um, if our exports are lower than our imports, right, then um, if our exports are lower than our imports, right, then if we're importing more goods, more goods are coming into the country, then that's going to be a negative number, right? So if our price levels increase, that's going to say Mexico or Mexicans are not going to want to buy American goods, right? Uh, if they can buy, let's say, timber from the United States or they can buy it from Canada and the prices are cheaper in Canada, they're going to buy it from Canada, right? Um, so we're going to lose that export to um, to Mexico, right? And so we, too, will turn around and instead of buying timber or lumber from the United States, we, turn, we too, and in our own country would look to Canada to purchase the lumber as well, or that timber. So, um, so because of that, um, you know, that, that decreases it as well. So, um, price levels go up, people are going to be buying less, uh, goods from us, right? Um, if price levels go down, more people from out of the country are going to be buying goods from us. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of get that, get that concept there. Okay. Now, uh, shifters for aggregate demand and aggregate supply is pretty simple stuff, guys. Um, it's just increasing or decreasing C, I, G, or X, N. So essentially, if we look at our model again, right, this is the D equals C plus I plus G plus X, N. And this is... All right, so you guys can see this, right? GDP equals AD, aggregate demand, which equals C plus I plus G plus XN, right? And so um, so you increase C, that's going to shift your aggregate demand curve to the right. You decrease C, that's going to shift your aggregate demand to the curve to the left, right? Uh, you increase I, that will increase, that will shift your curve to the right. Decrease I, that will shift it to the left. Uh, same for G and same for XN, right? Now, um, so some other shifters or some other things to kind of help us understand the shifters, right, is a uh, change in consumer spending, right? Um, so if we get more dis disposable income, that means you get more uh, money to be able to uh, purchase other goods, um, outside of your bills and stuff like that, outside of your mortgage, outside of your living, right? Um, higher increases are going to, in, going to cause you to spend more on consumer goods, right? Um, consumers expectations, right? So if there's a fear of a recession, people are going to start hoarding money or they're not going to be spending money so that they can get through the recession, right? Uh, household indebtedness, right? More consumer debt. So the more debt that we carry as a, as a country or as an, or as individuals, 
uh, add it all together, that also uh, will affect consumer spending, right? And then taxes, so uh, decrease in income taxes. So there's a decrease in taxes, right? That means that uh, we are not giving the government as much of our money, right? So we're able to spend more of our individual money, and that would increase uh, consumer spending. Now, um, change in investment spending, um, so real interest rates. Again, we're going to see with interest rates, we're going to see nominal and real. Um, real taking out the inflation. Um, so real interest rates is uh, the price of borrowing. So how much uh, people are borrowing. So if interest rates increase, right, that means it's more expensive to borrow money. That means that investment spending will go down. If interest rates decrease, that means that money is actually cheaper to borrow. So people are going to borrow more money, right? Um, future business expectations. So uh, if you have high expectations, right, people are going to go to your place to purchase or they're going to consumers will go and purchase there but then also businesses will invest in that right uh production technology right that would increase uh investment spending and then business taxes of course same with uh with consumer spending right if um, business taxes were to increase right so that means businesses have to pay more taxes then uh if they're paying more in taxes then uh they're not investing themselves and they're not um purchasing more goods for them, for them individual selves, uh, for their business. Um, but if, um, if corporate taxes or business taxes were to lower, then businesses could be purchasing more goods, right? Um, more business investment. Um, they could be purchasing better stoves, better, uh, equipment, better refrigerators stuff like that, better cash registers. Okay. All right, um, now shifting in government spending, right, is going to be uh, changing government spending. So um, right now we're going to see, you know, with the stimulus packages, um, however, whichever way it goes, we're going to see um, that there's going to be a lot of government spending, right? And that is going to, um, of course, um, more government spending increases G, G is going to increase aggregate demand, that increases AD, right? And then we'll see kind of later how using the business cycle, um, how and what the government does and with their spending and how that hopefully will get us out of a recession, um, uh, depending on how long this is, this is going to last for us. Uh, okay, so... Uh, decrease in uh, defense spending, right, um, uh, would, of course, uh, decrease uh, G, and decrease in G is going to cause uh, GDP and aggregate demand to, to fall, right? Um, an increase in public works, um, public works like, hey, we're going to start building more parks, we're going to build new buses for schools, um, you know, we're going to add an art museum to every every city or an additional art museum to every city, then... Um, that's going to cause aggregate demand to uh, increase. Now, um, last one is going to be change in net exports. So uh, X minus N or X minus N, um, however, however you guys note it. Um, so exchange rates, if uh, the U.S. Do dollar depreciates relative to the euro, that means that um, the, the, do the euro, if you're, you know, from a Euro uh, European Union country, you can... Uh, purchase more dollars with your euro, that means that price levels will be uh, cheaper, things will be cheaper in the United States for Europeans or vice versa. If uh, the, the peso depreciates uh, relative to the dollar, that means that the peso is actually, you, with the dollar, you can purchase more pesos. So if you're able to purchase more pesos than um, or Mexican pesos, then you're able to purchase more Mexican goods, right? So um, that um, would, uh, depending on, on the exchange rate, that would either increase or decrease your net exports. Um, your national income uh, compared to abroad, that's another uh, changer for your net exports. And again, uh, aggregate demand is just going to equal GDP. GDP equals C plus I plus G plus uh, XN. All right. So, um I'm going to go ahead and move over to my next presentation, which is going to be the multiplier. So 
So those of you guys in my class, if you guys want to go ahead and move on to presentation 3.2. and multipliers. Okay. All right. Cool. Real quick, uh, Alexis, you had a question of uh, why gas prices uh, were going down. So um, the reason why gas prices are going down is um, even before this coronavirus, right? And Joan, I'll get to you next, brother. Um, why gas prices are going down is uh, before this. Um, I don't. I don't remember. Was something with Saudi Arabia maybe producing more oil or not listening to OPEC or um, uh, one of the one one of those countries, one of the OPEC countries, were supplying too much or um, I'm not sure exactly what it was, um, but we were going to have an abundance of supply, and so you know, when there's an abundance of supply, you're going to shift your supply curve to the right. And so since we have so much that brings price levels down now, uh, coupled with, uh, we're kind of experiencing a double shift, right? That double shift being that now demand is low because people are not driving. Right. So, um, gas is just sitting there. Right. So, um, and now we're going to shift the demand curve to the left, right, which price levels will go down. Now, uh, remember the double shift rule, which is, um, of course, if price, uh, one of the two, either price or quantity will be indeterminate. So quantity would be the indeterminate, and we know that price levels would for sure uh, go down. So um, if you're not in the El Paso area, or if, you know, people that are not in the El Paso area, you'll notice that price levels are uh, dipping down, and that's, you know, it's just a double double shift that's uh, that's occurring, right? All right, so moving on to the multiplier, that's gonna to be topic uh, 3.2. Oh, yeah, thanks, Jonah. Yeah, I'd forgotten. I think that I think that that's really easily Google, Googleable, I think. <laughs> so um, I, I think you're right on that. Something something over regulating oil, or I, I don't remember what, but it's just the, the end result was there's gonna be a lot more supply then. Um, than uh, than they had anticipated, right? And then, of course, you know we've got the supply, and then we've got the the demand uh, aspect of that as well. Um, why is it worded GDP demanded? Um, it is worded GDP demanded uh, because it's a demand curve, right? And so, um, and downward sloping demand curve. Uh, so, uh, just name GDP demanded. I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have a. A really good answer for that, Jonah. I just, uh, I just know that it's called GDP demanded. So, um, I wish I had something better for you than that. Um, but I think just is a downward sloping demand. It's a demand curve. So, um, and we're we're referencing GDP. So, uh, that's that would be my my guess there. All right. Um, now, um, so. Okay, so let's look at uh, the multiplier effect. All right, now I, it, normally I do this in class, but you know, since we're doing kind of a virtual class, can't really do this, right? But um, imagine I give a student some money, right? And then, or I'm going to buy a good from a student, right? I'm going to buy their cell from, cell phone from them. Um, and let's just not, let's take out, you know, all the all the, you know, it's, it's obviously a used cell phone, so it wouldn't count toward GDP. But let's take that concept out for a second. Let's just imagine that this this student is producing cell phones, right? Uh, they're making cell phones. And so I would turn around and I'd buy a cell phone for them for 300 bucks, right? So now we've increased GDP by $300, right? Now let's say that student, right? We'll call that student Jonah, right? For since they're commenting, right? Jonah goes up to Ryan, right? And Ryan is selling burritos, right? And so he buys, let's say $300 worth of burritos, right? And now that's now uh, added to consumer spending, right? So that's three. That's added the three hundred that I bought the cell phone for, and then the three hundred that I bought the burritos for. That's now increased GDP by six hundred, right? But in our economy, right, in our little virtual classroom, we only have three hundred dollars, right? But we've spent 
or where GDP is now at $600. Now let's take that further. Now Ryan takes that $300 and he takes it to uh, JC, right? Um, or I'm sorry, JR. And he takes it to JR and says, hey man, I'm gonna buy, um, you know, whatever JR is selling, he's selling, uh, let's say cars, right? So he buys a $300 car. Sure, that's not gonna be a great car, but whatever. So he's buying a car from him. And um, so now we've added another $300 to the economy. That's now we're at our GDP is at 300 or 900, right? And so J, JR now takes takes that money, right? That $300 and he goes and he buys, um, he buys uh, some hamburgers from Alexis, right? And now we're at, um, now we're at, 1200 right? So that's increased our GDP. And again, the only thing that's moving in the economy is at $300, right? So that is what's the multiplier effect, right? And so think about that for a second. I want you to kind of think why a, why a city like El Paso would be so excited about having the Sun Bowl, right? Like why would we want a bowl game here in El Paso, you know? Uh, or why would a team want the final four at their, or why would a city, I'm sorry, why would a city want a final four at their, in their city, right? Now, what, what would be the reasoning for that? Um, not everybody is a sports fan, right? But why, why would we want that? So the reason you'd want that, right, is because think about it. You have people that are going to be coming in from outside of the city, right? And they're going to be spending money at your city, right? And so let's say, you know, um, and it's going to, it's going to set off a spending chain, right? Um, you know, people that come from outside of El Paso to come into El Paso to spend money on the Sun Bowl, they're going to buy a hotel, they're going to have to eat, they're going to want to do some entertaining things other than the Sun Bowl, and they're going to spend money here. So imagine that Bobby goes and spends a hundred dollars at Jason's, uh, Jason, my buddy Jason salon, right? Uh, at O'Hare's. And then let's say now Jason has more income. He has a hundred dollars more income than he normally would have during that, uh, during that bowl game. So then he turns around and he goes to, let's say, and spends a hundred dollars on Julio's Mexican restaurant. Right. And now Julio the owner of Julio, I would imagine, right <laughs> now he has more income. So he's going to go buy a uh, hundred dollars worth of Marco's pizza. Right. And so now Marco, again, hopefully that's the owner's name. <laughs> uh, Marco now is going to purchase a hundred dollars. And then, so again, uh, that example that I used earlier, this is just kind of reiterating that it's just the same thing, right? It's, it's, we've just put a hundred dollars into the market and that's set off a, a chain of spending of over $400. Right. And that's increased our GDP. So, um, again, that's why cities are very eager to have, um, you know, like the Sun Bowl or to have other uh, sporting events or other, you know, activities that are going to draw people in from out of town. So uh, I know in El Paso, um, I think it was like four years ago, we had like a national bowling tournament that brought like 100,000 people or something crazy like that. And that uh, definitely helped out our our local um, GDP or our um, now, uh, the multiplying effect shows how spending is magnified in the economy. Okay, so expect uh, effects on government spending. So, if the government were to spend five million, right, will aggregate demand increase by the same amount? So, no, aggregate demand will not increase as more as more increase even more as government spending becomes income for other consumers. Consumers will take that money and spend it, thus increasing aggregate demand. Right, so. Even with government spending, you're going to see that multiplying effect, right? So how much will aggregate demands increase? Well, it's going to depend, right? It's going to depend on how much of the new income consumers are saving, right? Now think about that. There's two things you can do with money, right? One, two, right? What are the one, two things you can do with money? You can either save it or you can spend it, right? So there's two things that you can do. So we need to figure out, all right, if we are going to, how much, if the government's going to increase so they're going to send out that stimulus package, right? It's going to be anywhere from, I don't know, $1,000 to $1,500 is what I've heard, right? So any per, we, the government needs to know, okay, how much are they going to spend and how much are they going to save, right? Because that's key in understanding and how much money they need to send out into the economy, right? Because they want to increase 
uh, our GDP, right, by a, a certain value. So um, if people are going to save a lot of that money, then aggregate demand will increase not very much, right? Now, if people are going to go out and spend every last cent of that uh, stimulus package, then aggregate demand is going to increase quite a bit, right? And why is it going to increase quite a bit? Because of that multiplier effect, right? So um, that brings us up to our next concept, right, which is the marginal propensity to consume. So the marginal propensity to consume, or from here on out, is just going to be MPC, right? Your MPC is how much people consume rather than save, right? And guess what? There's going to be marginal propensity to save, right? We'll see that one here in a second. So, uh, so how much people consume rather than save when there is a change in their disposable income? So we're going to see that here in, a, in shortly, right, whenever the government figures out the stimulus package, right? They'll send that out and we'll see, you know, hey, how much, um, we'll see how much the MPC and the MP, the MPS is. Um, now, it's always expressed as a fraction uh, or a decimal, right? Now, uh, equa the equation for MPC, I'll show it to you guys here in a second, is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be MPC is change in consumption. over over changing disposable income all right and that's your equation for um for mpc now, real quick, if you guys uh, want to do this real quick and we can kind of see if um, real quick, just kind of an example. So $100, you receive $100, right? And you spend 50, right? 50. And then you receive $100, right? I'm just going to put at a plus, right? And then you spend 80, right? So just kind of look at those two questions, give you guys kind of a second to figure out what your MPC is for, uh, for each of those. Right. Yeah. So real quick, you know, I mean, uh, if you receive a hundred dollars and you spend a hundred dollars and you spend $50, then your MPS is, uh, MPC is going to be uh, 0.5, right? If, uh, that would mean that your MPC is going to be, I mean, your MPS is going to be 1.5 as well, right? Um, because your MPS plus your MPC is going to be one. We'll see that here in a second too. And so, uh, if you receive a hundred dollars, right. And you spend 80, that means your MPC is going to be 0.8, right? Your MPS will be 0.2. Um, if you receive a hundred dollars and you spend a hundred dollars, which is what the government's hoping you do with your stimulus package, then your MPC is going to be one, right? All right. Now moving on to uh, marginal propensity to save. So the marginal propensity to save or the MPS is how much people save rather than consume when there, uh, when there's a change in disposable income, it is always expressed as a fraction, right? Or a decimal point actually. Um, now, um, so MPS, right, is how much you save or how much we're going to save if with that stimulus package that should be coming up, right? And so let's see, the equation for that, right, is just a little different than MPC, right? All we're going to do is instead of changing, we're going to change consumption here and change that C to an S. Right, not the best handwriting, but you guys get it, right? MPS, and that's what's gonna be changing in spending over change in disposable income equals your MPS, right? Now, uh, looking up here, if we were to do the same questions, right? Um, our MPC for, if we spend 50, our MPC would be 
0.5, our MPS would be 0.5. Here again, I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, 100, if we're given $100 on that stimulus package, but we're supposed to be getting quite a bit more, but just as an easy number, right? We get 100, we spend 80, our MPC would be 0.8, our MPS would be 0.2, right? Now, um, <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so if you receive $100, your MPC is 0.70, what is, or 0.7, what is your MPS? So again, I'm just read, read that question again to you guys. If you receive $100, right, your MPC is 0.7. So that means what you're going to do is you're going to keep 70% of that $100. What is your MPS? Um, you're going to save $30, right, or you're gonna, your MPS is going to be 0.3. All right. Any questions or anything on that? Any comments anybody wants to make on that? All right. So let's move on. Okay. Next one, your MPS is one is equal to one minus your MPC. So why is this true? This is true because you're going to you can only do two things with money. You can either consume it or you can save it. Right. So let me write that out for you guys real quick. Um, maybe MPS equals one minus MPC, right? And so you can also do this like this, right? MPS plus MPC equals one, right? So just kind of two ways to look at that. You guys are real good at math. You guys are kind of realize that you know you can move this around to however you want right but that is your um marginal propensity to save marginal propensity to consume right so all right um so let's go ahead and move on okay so calculating the spending multiplier if the multiplier is 0.5 what is the multiplier all right so again how do we how do we come up with the multiplier? You can come up with the multiplier using two, two things here. All right, that's crazy. I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> that's funny. All right, um, so uh, your spending multiplier is, um, Multiplier. Now you can find your spending multiplier one of two ways, right? It's one over MPS, right? Or it's one over one minus MPC, right? And you're gonna see real quickly, right? That that's essentially the same thing, right? Because we do know that MPC plus MPS is it gonna equal to one. So by subtracting the one from MPC, that's going to give you this already. This is just kind of an initial, like an additional step that you're going to have to take. But whichever one you think is easier for you to understand, uh, I'd kind of just gravitate to that and keep that, right? Um, so, um, Dixie, you can um, you can replay this if, if that's helpful for you guys. Um, I'll put it on, my, on the playlist, so uh, no big deal, right? All right. Um, the whiteboard is cute. It's, it is, in fact, my daughter's whiteboard. So, <laughs> all right. Let's get back to let's get back to this, guys. All right. So, um, back to calculating the spending multiplier, right? Um, again, you can. Uh, it's one over uh, MPS or one over one minus MPC, right? And so, if the multiplier is four, how much will that increase um, $5 in government spending, how much is that gonna increase the GDP? Well, the, the, it's the multiplier times the initial change in spending is going to change the GDP. So let me write that out for you guys. So change in GDP is gonna to equal to the multiplier times the change in spending. Okay, so um, I think you guys can see that pretty good there. All right, 
Um, hopefully the glare is not that bad. Anyway, uh, again, change in uh, GDP is going to be the multiplier times the change in spending, right? So um, if the government were to change its spending by $5, and, and that's not really re realistic because that's such a small amount, but it was, let's say, $5 billion, right? If the government's going to spend $5 billion in the stimulus package, which I don't know what the amount is, but uh, we'll see that here in a second. Um, not in a second, but we'll see that when, whenever Congress kind of figures it out. So uh, the change in spending is going to be a billion, right? And so you take the um, multiplier, which is four, multiply that by five, and that's going to give you a change of 20 billion in GDP. So now it works the same way going the other way, right? So um, if the multiplier is... I'm sorry, if it's negative, right? So if the change in spending is negative times the multiplier, right? Um, then that would decrease, of course, decrease GDP, right? Okay. Okay, so, um, so how is spending multiplied? So let's see, assume that the MPC of everyone is 0.5 right for everyone and let's say again we talked about the sun bowl right the sun bowl in el paso um uh or the sun bowl coming to el paso or the sun bowl that happens annually, annually in el paso right and let's say um someone comes in and they spend a hundred dollars again at my buddy jason's uh salon right oh hairs uh haircut place whatever you barber whatever you want to call it uh they spend a hundred dollars at that at that place right and so jason's mpc is 0.5 right so he's going to take $50, right? And he's going to put it in a savings account. He's going to take that other $50, he's going to go to Julio's, right? And he's going to spend $50 at Julio's, right? And then um, then Julio takes that $50 and his his MPC, again, is 0.5, right? So he's going to take 25. He's going to put that in the savings account. He's going to take the other 25. He's going to go to Marcos, right? And buy some pizza at Marcos for 25. Then he's going to take... Marco is going to take that $25, right? And he's going to spend 12.5, right? Or uh, $12.50 and then take the uh, the other 25, the $12.50 and put that in the bank. And you're going to keep happening until you've spent every last cent, right? So um so just kind of moving on to uh, you know that that that's you're gonna see that until every last cent is changed, right? So it the multiplier is two at point five, right? Um, let's see here real quick. So if the multiplier, I'm sorry, the um, MPC is point five, right? So it'd be 0.51 minus 0.5 over one. So it's going to be 0.5 over one. So our multiplier is going to equal two, right? So everybody kind of see that real quick. So again, if our MPC is 0.5, we'll subtract the one from 0.5, divide that out. One over uh, 0.5 gives us two. Uh, our multiplier is two. So um, if our initial spending is 100 and our MPC is 0.5, then the multiplier is going to increase GDP by 200, right? So um, now, um, all right, so now what about tax cuts, right? So, um, because when the government cuts taxes, that's also going to have a multiplying effect too, right? Um, now the, I want you to kind of start thinking what's going to be greater. Do, um, you want tax cuts? I mean, what's going to be greater, a taxing multiplier or the spending multiplier? So just kind of right now in the back of your mind, start thinking, which one do you think is going to be better? All right. Um, so the multiplier effect also applies when governments cut taxes or increase taxes, right? But changing taxes is gonna have less of an impact on government spending. And why is it going to have less of an impact on government spending? Well, let's, let's look into that real quick, all right? Um, so um, let's assume that the MPC is 0.75. 
and that the multiplier is four. If the government cuts taxes by four million, how much will consumers increase uh, spending increase? Well, it's not going to be sixteen million, right? So when the government, when they cut taxes, consumers will save a million and spend three million, right? So they have to the taxes have to be cut out first, right? And so uh, the three million is the amount magnified in the economy. So it's going to be. 0.3 times four, and then so 12 million would increase uh, consumer spending. So um, how do we get the uh, taxing multiplier? Okay, the taxing multiplier is going to be a little bit different than the spending multiplier. And that's gonna be um, MPC, let me read what this is. MPC times one over MPS or MPC over MPS. Okay. All right, so um, you have the texting multiplier is going to be MPC times one over MPS, or the easier of the two equations is just going to be uh, MC over MPS. And the easy way to kind of remember this one is um, that C in the alphabet comes before S, right? So uh, C will be in the numerator and then uh, S or savings will be in the denominator, right? Um, all right, guys, um, just uh, you guys that are in the comments, uh, I know a lot of you guys are not from this class and, you know, um, you guys are just, you know, we're trying to help everyone out and that's trying to watch or trying to uh, pass the AP test all here trying to learn, learn some stuff. So, um, learn some AP economics trying to get, uh, to get to be able to, uh, pass those FRQs, please. Um, I appreciate that guys. All right. Um, let's go ahead and get back to, uh, back to this. Um, so, uh, again, same way, like if the taxing multiplier, you're going to, you're going to multiply that by the initial, uh, change in taxes, right? And that's going to, that's going to equal your GDP, right? Uh, or result in your GDP. So, uh, if the spending multiplier is four, then taxing multiplier is uh, only three. Okay. Uh, but remember that if there's an increase in taxes, uh, that decreases GDP, right? So taxing multiplier is actually going to be negative. Okay. Uh, there's not a negative on there, but, um, uh, there's not a negative on the equation, but you just assume that it's a negative because it is taxes, right? All right. All right. So um, just kind of open it up to uh, some questions real quick. Um, if anybody's got uh, any questions that they have or would like to ask, um, that way I can uh, get those answered for you guys real quick. <laughs> uh, you guys can also comment on the um, on the um, remind app if you guys like. Um, I know some of my first period they they don't have uh, access to it yet, but uh, I'll put a link up for you guys so that you guys can see. You guys have any questions or anything like that? Um, do you guys want me to try to maybe on Friday we can go over some FRQs? Um, there's a few FRQs that we could have gone over in this section. Uh, definitely some multiple choice questions, but like uh, I mentioned, those of you guys that uh, are taking the AP test, uh, there's not going to be any multiple choice questions. It's going to be all FRQs. So. Um, Alexis, the presentations, uh, are you in my class or are you not in my class? Okay, so um, um, what period do I have you? That's weird. Um, Oh, 
Sorry, Alexis. Yes. <laughs> That's bad. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, you can see them in the, uh, they should be uh, in unit three. In unit three, um, PowerPoint, um, PowerPoint 2.1 and 3.2. All right, real quick, uh, let's just do um, an example of the uh, taxing multiplier, okay? So, um, all right. Okay, remember that the taxing multiplier is, uh, I'm just gonna use MPC over MPS, right? And so let's just say that our MPC is 0.8 and our MPS is 0.3, okay? <laughs> Can you do that? Is that a thing? Is 0.3, is that gonna work out? No, it's not gonna work out, right? Because that's that's greater than, than one, right? So it's gotta be 0.2, okay? Just trying to see if you guys Catch you guys on your toes. All right, so what does this mean? That means that if people, if they get more money, right, or if taxes are going to decrease, right, then uh, people will consume 8.8 or 80% of that tax consumption, right, or that tax decrease, well, um, uh, this, they will save 0.2 or 20% of that, right? Okay, so um, now if you divide out uh, 0.8, by 0.2, that's going to give you four, right? So that is our taxing multiplier, right? So if they decrease, if they decrease taxes by, let's say, um, 10 billion, right? They're going to their new bill that's going to come in. They're going to decrease taxes by 10 billion. Um, how is that going to affect the economy? Well, that's going to affect the economy by four times the 10 billion will uh, increase, right? taxes by, or that will increase GDP by, uh, by 40 billion, right? Does that make sense? Now, if they're gonna increase taxes, then this will be a negative, right? So that's gonna be a negative, and so that will decrease GDP by 40 billion, same way, right? So, um, that is a, uh, an example for uh, the taxing multiplier and changing GDP. Um, any other questions? Any other thing you guys got? Alexis, yes, it is on Schoology. Um, I can double check, uh, afterwards, um, just to make sure. I, I think I copied it over to, uh, to eighth period. Um, but, um, for some reason, maybe it didn't, it didn't get copied, right? All right, guys. Um, so we'll go ahead and call it uh, call it a day. And uh, thank you guys for uh, for tuning in. Appreciate everybody that stayed with us for the whole time. Uh, if you guys have any uh, any questions or comments, just go ahead and reach out to me. Uh, you can get me on uh, Twitter at Econ Jager. Uh, if you're not subscribed, if you guys could please subscribe, I really appreciate that. And uh, if you could give it a thumbs up, that'd be awesome. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Uh, we'll be doing this again on Friday at two o'clock. So. Uh, See you guys then. Peace.